Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Good, bad, crazy martinis for conservatives, and we'll get into all those political stories in just a moment, but a quick shout out as a Bears fan, Jim, uh, and really anybody who's a football fan today, very sad to know of the passing of Gail Sayers, uh, the great Bears halfback from the 60s and very early 70s, passing at the age of 77, had been battling dementia for a number of years, and you and I are both too young to remember watching him live, but uh, do yourself a favor, especially if you like football, uh, throw on a, a YouTube video today of Gail Sayers' highlights. He was kind of the prototype of, of, of Barry Sanders, his, uh, his speed, his shiftiness, and if they had the ability to reconstruct knees in the late 60s as they do now, his uh, career would have been truly phenomenal. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Brian Song, his relationship with Brian Piccolo, legendary, turned into a movie. But uh, the tough year in a lot of different ways. A lot of famous people that we really, really respected uh, have passed away. And uh, so it's a tough day for Bears fans and football fans everywhere today. Yeah, just for perspective, Greg, my understanding is that the Grim Reaper needed an IV after finally catching up to Gale Sayers. That's how fast he was right up until the end. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So uh, look it up today. The Bears had uh, two of the first four picks in 1965. The third and the fourth pick, they went with uh, Dick Butkus and Gail Sayers. Uh, I think it turned out pretty well uh, for them. Uh, unfortunately, in the mid-60s, they had another team in the NFL called the Packers who were kind of good. All right, let's get on to our good, bad, and crazy martinis. Good one, Jim. We have to decide whether this is the Democrats actually coming to sanity or just realizing that their previous stance was probably not good election year politics. Because when we found out that Mitch McConnell was moving forward with the, with the process on a Supreme Court nomination, and then we talked yesterday about how he's got the votes, at some point in that whole sequence, Chuck Schumer was out there saying, everything is on the table. If, uh, if, if, if the Republicans go through with this, that means now, that means if the Democrats win the majority following the election. And, and so uh, yesterday we talked about how Obama and Clinton people were talking about court packing, but maybe some folks in the Senate are backing off. This is from the Hill. Senate Democrats are tamping down talk of expanding the Supreme Court if Republicans fill the seat held by the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Progressive activists and some lawmakers have raised the idea since Ginsburg's death was announced on Friday night, arguing the party needs to be ready to take bold steps if they have the Senate majority and the White House next year while facing a six to three conservative court. But the point here is, is that Dianne Feinstein, who would once again be chairwoman of the Senate Judiciary Committee if Democrats do take back the majority, is now nixing the idea of killing the legislative filibuster which means there would be 60 votes necessary to agree to legislation. Wouldn't just be a rules change, but they would need legislation to be able to pack the court. And you're never going to get 60 votes to do that, no matter how well the Democrats realistically do uh, in November. So, Jim, uh, I don't know if you think this is actually them coming back to reality. Feinstein realizing it's a political loser to talk about it now. But um, if this is a genuine conclusion, that's obviously a good thing. Yeah, so it, there, there are two ways this is not an enormously shocking announcement. Dianne Feinstein has always been on sort of the institutionalist side of the Democratic Party. She's been there a very long time. She has memories of the Senate being a more amiable, the saying of the Senate being the, 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 the saucer that the tea cools in. And the idea that uh, uh, the Senate is supposed to be, take its time, supposed to take, it's not to be, supposed to be making wild, rash decisions. And eliminating the filibuster would be one of those. The only kind of cautionary note I would add here is that Dianne Feinstein has, you know, last couple of years, she has said something, and then the next day she's insisted she never said it, or insisted that she misunderstood it, or insisted that, you know, she said yesterday A, but she really meant B, or something like that. So I don't necessarily want to think I'd feel like I'd put all of my hopes on Dianne Feinstein being the bulwark, no pun intended, um, <laughs> that would stand up against this proposal. But I think it's safe to say that, look, you look at her, you look at Joe Manchin, you look at uh, Kirsten Cinema, you look at, uh, well, Doug Jones probably won't be here starting in January, but there, there are a handful of Democratic senators who are not 100% on board with this, who kind of recognize, who, who have learned from uh, how the elimination of the filibuster for judicial nominations went for them. I think Amy Klobuchar had made comments along that, where she says that actually if they had to do that over, they might have resisted the urge to eliminate the filibuster for 
uh, judicial nominations because they, you know, once they had done that, the Republicans eliminated the filibuster for Supreme Court nominations. You know, it's not certain that you would have uh, all 50 Democratic senators, or let's say there's more than that after, after the election. And if you end up with, you know, you, you need 50 votes to do this. So you would need 50 votes to change the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, you'd probably need more. You'd probably need to eliminate the filibuster to pass the Green New Deal. You'd probably need to, you know, to get much of what Democrats want to get done, they'd have to eliminate the filibuster. So it's a good sign. It's the fact that she's willing to say so at a time it's not going to be very public is a good sign. Um, whether, you know, but then again, there was a lot of times where it looked like Obamacare wasn't going to pass and you saw Democrats eventually coming to line on that one. So, um, there's always a chance that, you know, the party leaders can get everybody to all their ducks in a row and twist enough arms and or threaten them and or reveal where bodies are buried. For example, if, if it really got tough, Chuck Schumer could threaten to expose the Chinese spy who was driving Dianne Feinstein around for a long time. <laughs> That's a huge secret that nobody's reported on. Not nearly. It was reported, just no one talked about it. Yeah, it just kind of got uh, got buried. No big deal. If that had been a Republican, it probably would have been slightly different in the, uh, in the amount of coverage. So Chuck Schumer basically has a full book of matches, and maybe one match just got blown out. But uh, don't assume that just because Feinstein's doing this that they won't push for this. Uh, it all depends on how in, insane the base is, uh, if in fact uh, the Democrats win and, uh, and, and Trump's Supreme Court nominee gets through. We don't even know yet, which we'll talk about later in the crazy martini. But on to the bad martini now, Jim. And by the time this podcast posts, uh, we'll probably know the news on this. We'll go to Louisville, Kentucky, where Louisville police have declared a state of emergency as the city braces for a grand jury decision on the fate of three cops involved in the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor, which was back in March. Days off and vacation requests for all Louisville Metro Police Department personnel are canceled until further notice pending State Attorney General Daniel Cameron's announcement on whether the cops involved in that shooting will face criminal charges. And we now know that that decision will come at 1.30 p.m. today, Eastern Time. So a lot of you will know what was announced by the time you hear this. Uh, And Jim, we don't know what's going to happen Cameron, of course, uh, we saw him at the convention. Uh, I don't know that there's any announcement he could make that will make a lot of the folks that are commonly in the streets pleased. We know that uh, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend was shooting at the police. He alleges that he didn't know they were police. He thought they were home invaders. But if the police are being fired at and they fire back, that could be grounds for uh, not filing charges and, and so forth. So we need to be ready for a lot of different things here. But one of the things I think we need to be ready for is a lot of chaos in Louisville today and possibly beyond. Yeah, Greg, there's, look, as our listeners will probably know what this decision is by the time they listen to this. But as of this time, a little bit after noon on Wednesday, look, you know, the fact that the police are, are calling out for these measures certainly thinks they expect there to be public anger which doesn't necessarily mean they know what the decision is going to be, but it certainly thinks that, you know, a either not pressing charges or pressing uh, relatively light charges is certainly within the mix of possibilities. Look, there's really no reasoning with an angry mob. A, an angry mob doesn't want to listen to legal arguments, but I'm kind of reminded of the circumstances of the shooting of Trayvon Martin and the trial of George Zimmerman. Uh, people probably remember this from a couple of years ago. It's 2012. Zimmerman shot Trayvon Martin. A lot of people believe that this was a uh, you know, racially inspired shooting. It was vigilantism. Zimmerman was charged with murder by a special prosecutor who was appointed by Governor Rick Scott. Now, a lot of people looked at it and said, you know, second degree murder, manslaughter, like you, you basically have to prove that this was deliberate, that this was not an accidental shooting. And the two of them were struggling over a firearm, which was effectively the defense that was put out there. Lo and behold, the jury came back and he was acquitted. And a couple of people kind of said, you know, if you'd gone after lesser charges, you might have gotten a, a jury to come back with a, with a conviction. The uh, Department of Justice, uh, by the way, under President Obama, investigated Zimmerman on civil rights charges. DOJ concluded there was not sufficient evidence that Zimmerman intentionally violated the civil rights of Martin. Right? This is not what a lot of people wanted to hear. But this kind of this inverse relationship between the, in the seriousness of the charge and the seriousness of the penalty and the likelihood that a jury is going to come back with a conviction. It's a higher bar to clear. If you, charge, if you go for one of the lesser charges, it's generally easier to get the conviction. Uh, I believe that when the police shoot someone who was not, uh, not only not guilty of a crime, not even charged with a crime, when it's an accidental shooting, you have to have accountability. Oopsie is not going to cut it. 
being able to prove that these cops deliberately killed someone, uh, that they deliberately violated civil rights, that they deliberately, did, it's going to be much hard, much tougher. That's generally what you need to do if you want to do most uh, murder charges. Manslaughter might be a different story. I'm not a legal expert. And the district attorney is the one who has to look at every little detail of this case, every witness statement, every uh, police statement, every, every forensics, all the uh, firearms, ballistics, all that kind of stuff. And they have to look at it and say, can we get a jury of 12 people to say, yes, this was a crime. This person needs to be punished for it. I, I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. Uh, we're going to find this out today. The answer may well be, I don't think I can do this. And the you know, public is not going to like hearing it. But the job of the prosecutor is not to make the crowd happy. The popular choice is not always the right choice. Now, here's the thing. I think you know, these cops got to be held accountable one way or the other. But maybe a criminal trial isn't the way to do it. Maybe you're just not going to be able to convince 12 people that this was a deliberate act of murder. You know, negligence, reckless you know, behavior. There's, there's other lesser charges you could try to get here. So we'll see how this shakes out. But uh, ominous sign for Louisville. Hopefully the day ends calmly. But uh, I guess we'll know in a couple hours, Greg. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it was, I uh, believe, just last week that the city agreed to a $12 million settlement with Taylor's family. They also made some police reforms, including uh, higher ups needing to approve warrant requests from officers before they go forward to a judge. And so uh, Rand Paul's uh, pushing to ban no knock warrants for federal warrants, which is all he can do from the federal level. Uh, so perhaps some some good and sensible reforms can come here, which will protect public safety, but also protect lives and and uh, and rights of people who are under investigation. So it's it's going to be a tough day in Louisville, probably one way or the other. Uh, but uh, but hopefully people act responsibly. Hey guys, it's Mock and Daisy from the Chicks on the Right, and we're excited to tell you about our podcast, the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. If you've been stressed lately with the information overload on social media or just don't feel like anything in the news makes sense anymore, don't worry, because we're here to clear things up. Every week, we discuss topics like cancel culture, national crisis, what's happening to our new generations. And if you're just plain tired of people trying to tell you what to do or how to live your life, we tackle that too. Find out more by going to our website, chicksontheright.com, or start listening on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or your favorite favorite podcast app. Don't forget to leave a comment or review and subscribe. All right, let's move on to our crazy martini now, Jim. And of course, we don't know officially who the president's Supreme Court nominee is going to be. He has only said that it will be a woman. Uh, Most of the buzz, as we've said the last couple of days, centers around Amy Coney Barrett. And so the hit pieces are already coming out, including uh, shots at her Catholic faith in a number of different ways. But Newsweek and Reuters are going with the uh, comparisons to a group that she's with known as the People of Praise as being the inspiration for The Handmaid's Tale, which is uh, the dystopian novel where women have no rights and women uh, and they, they're under the thumb of men and so forth. And so they go on and on in this story about how horrible it is to be uh, a woman in this group and how it's so repressive and on and on and on. And then it gets to the bottom of the Newsweek story. Correction. This article's headline originally stated that people of praise inspired The Handmaid's Tale. The book's author, Margaret Atwood, has never specifically mentioned the group as being the inspiration for her work. A New Yorker profile of the author from 2017 mentions a newspaper clipping as part of her research for the book of a different charismatic Catholic group, People of Hope. Newsweek regrets the air. Uh, You know, this whole article that we just rolled out there, guns blazing against a woman who's not even nominated yet, the whole premise for that? Yeah, never mind. Yeah, it's a very Emily Latella moment. Um, And just one other kind of wrinkle to add to that. Uh, look, okay, I, I guess you can understand how you could mix up uh, the people of hope and people of praise, but if you are a reporter, your your job is to get it right. Your your job is to keep these things straight and not to say, oh, all these Christian religious sects looks the same to me. They don't. They're the same, you know, you, they, there's a distinction there. By the way, Amy Coney Barrett is reportedly a member of people of praise, but as I understand it, she has never confirmed this or discussed this publicly. Uh, Reuters wrote a you know piece that's being torn apart, but it there, did at least make the reference that she is a purported member. Uh, certainly, if she's a nominee, this will probably come up in, in there. There's one other kind of detail to this that jumped out at me. So yeah, not only is it a different group, people of hope versus people of praise, but the other thing is that if you look at that New Yorker profile, it is a reference to an Associated Press item reported on a Catholic congregation in New Jersey being taken over by a fundamentalist sect in which wives were called handmaidens, a word that Atwood had underlined. And based upon this, a lot of people are saying, aha, okay, well, you know, this is your sign, this is your evidence that the people of hope were the inspiration for The Handmaid's Tale. This is impossible. 
I am flat out telling you right now, this is cannot be the case based upon what we have seen in this New, York, New Yorker article. The reason this cannot be the case is you can go back and you can look for the Associated Press article about this, about Berkeley Heights, New Jersey. It was written by Frank Bajak back on October 30th, 1985. Headline, Residents of Quiet Town Say Separatist Cult Taking Over Local Church. It was sent out on the AP Wire. This is with 99, put as many nines after that, you know, as you like, certain what the, the Associated Press article that is referred to in this, uh, in, in that uh, New Yorker profile of Margaret Atwood. The odds that she had found some other AP, first of all, there's no indication that there ever was any other AP article about this religious sect. The, you know, the, this became a issue beyond the locality on October 30th, 1985. Jim, why are you harping on this? Because she finished writing Handmaid's Tale in June of 1985, according to her diary described in the uh, uh, Observer newspaper over in the UK. And it says the page proof were read by the 19th of August and the book's official publication date is August 1985. It is not possible, short of the use of a time-traveling DeLorean, for an October 1985 news article to influence a book that is in stores by August. So this is not the case. Now, it's possible that Margaret Atwood kept this news article and saw the Handmaiden's uh, line and thought it was significant and maybe she wanted to work on a sequel. She ended up working on a, publishing a sequel decades later. But there is no way that that article about that group in New Jersey that inspired The Handmaid's Tale, because that article came out a good two to three months after the book was published. And I, I've been arguing all day long with people on Twitter who keep insisting, but maybe there was another AP article about another religious sect in another town in New Jersey, and maybe they called their women members handmaidens too. And No, no, stop coming up with hypothetical scenarios. You got caught saying something that wasn't true. Take the loss. Admit it. Eat it. It's going to stink. And then move on. Because you, I just get so infuriated when people start, you know, asserting things because they want them to be true, and they are not actually true. It's just, people might say this is a stupid thing to get hung up on, but this is how narratives get constructed, Greg. And when they are false, some of us are obligated to push this back. I'm that, I, I will stop before I start, you know, stammering and, and, and pounding the, the table and breaking my microphone. Yeah, yeah. Two quick things here. First of all, uh, Maisie Hirono has already said that uh, Barrett's religion, if she's the nominee, is fair game. So get ready for that ugliness from her and probably others in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, also, Jim, I believe you said this uh, on Twitter or in the Jolter or somewhere. Uh, you know, if Amy Coney Barrett is part of some group that's the inspiration for The Handmaid Tale, it's kind of weird that she was so under the thumb of her husband that she rose to the appellate court of the United States and is on the short list for the U.S. Supreme Court. If they're suppressing women, they're doing a terrible job at it. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's nonsensical. Look, the interesting thing is that the Maisie Coronos of the world, probably, it appears they look at the Kavanaugh process and say that was a win. They believe that went well for them. They, they believe that on some level they won the fight, even though Brett Kavanaugh is on the uh, Supreme Court. And, you know, they only lost one Democrat, Joe Manchin, on that. Uh, but, you know, I think you can point to the Republican wins in the Senate elections of 2018 as being heavily driven by the Kavanaugh fight. And you can find a lot of Republicans, or perhaps even former Republicans, right-leaning independents, who are not fans of President Trump, who were fine with the Kavanaugh selection, and who are just Spinning mad over the way the Democrats treated Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, I was thinking about it. I was back in the quote unquote war room type thing when I think, I think it was the Sotomayor fight. These conservative legal groups, they, they knew, look, Democrats had a majority in the Senate. They weren't going to stop. They, was, there was really no conceivable way they were going to be able to block the confirmation of Sonia Sotomayor. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to make it as easy as possible for every Republican senator to justify a no vote. And they wanted to make it as difficult as possible for every Democratic senator to justify a yes vote. You probably remember the controversy over Sonia Sotomayor's wise Latina comment and Lindsey Graham, ter you know, kind of gently but firmly tearing into her, pointing out that, like, look, if I said the opposite, that, you know, that as, a, as a white male, I have a greater insight into the law, people would tear me apart and justifiably so. You are you're arguing that people have better judgment because of the color of their skin and because of their gender. 
And, you know, Sotomayor, you know, kind of backtracked on that and kind of said that she didn't mean it that way and, you know, regretted that anybody could interpret it that way. This is what the minority party in the Senate traditionally does during a confirmation fight. You know you're going to lose. You want to keep your party unified. You want to maybe see if you can pick off a couple of the other, uh, of the other party. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Democrats were in that situation with Kavanaugh. And they should have just kind of recognized, you know what, this guy's totally qualified. We'll have all of our members vote no. But that wasn't good enough for them. They had to try to destroy him, try to destroy his reputation, put his family all through that. Listen to any uh, lunatic witness that, uh, that uh, who, who's, who's the shyster lawyer? Avenatti. Uh, Avenatti. Boy, probably one of the good things about 2020 is I've forgotten his name. <laughs> That does seem a long time ago. Uh, boy, I- I'm so glad he's not on the scene right now. That's the last thing 2020 needs is any Michael Avenatti. Uh, Jim, quite a day. We will see what tomorrow holds for us. Uh, and good luck to Louisville. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. We are always very grateful for a kind review and a five-star rating. Also, please remember you can get us on those home devices by saying play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Have a great day. We'll see you Thursday on the Three Martini Lunch.